Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is tips number 800. And in this video, I'm going to make one of these little South Bend grinding gauges. You've seen me use this in other videos, especially the ones where I talked about how to grind the tool bits for your lathe. So here was a big teaching aid that I had of that, and so we could check the various angles on a bit as you're grinding them. So that's the purpose of this. I think you already know that. And I have a drawing for this that will be available at my heap. So you can go ahead and look at that and print it out if you want to make one for all the dimensions. It's a very simple two-dimensional project that is not exactly a machine shop project, more of a metalworking. However, I will use the filing machine, which you probably never have seen me use, and the Bridgeport Mill. So let's begin. Use this QR code to instantly access my heap, which contains many, many of my project drawings that you can print out. If you're not in the mood for making this project, simply order one. They're only 60 cents. These pictures are from the South Bend How to Run a Lathe book. Now take a look at this. And these pictures are from the Sheldon book entitled Care and Operation of a Lathe. Notice any similarity? They're the exact same pictures, only it says Sheldon on the gauge. And this book was printed during World War II. So they must have had a sweetheart deal with each other. I encourage you people out there to start buying and collecting various layout tools. It's just wonderful to have all of these mainly stereo tools here, protractors, height gauges, squares, and all of that. So go ahead and accumulate those. You will love them. This is an original South Bend grinding gauge that I happened to come across rather recently at an auction. And that's what we're going to make. And I've already made a prototype. And you can use about any kind of material you want. You can even use cardboard for crying out loud. But this is stainless steel because this is stainless steel. And I'm using stainless steel only because I happen to have some. It really could matter less, but it could be aluminum. It could be plastic. Just about anything that you can imagine. And you may have watched a video I made some time ago. I know you hate 3D printing, but I did a, a, a 3D print. I also made one in the 3D printing that has the notches, the V's in here, and that is on Tinkercad, if anyone would be interested, but I doubt it, because we're metal workers, and don't worry, I'm not going to show my 3D printer probably ever again. I put it out to pasture. For those of you that are interested, this is my page on Autodesk Tinkercad, and if you look down here through some of my old projects, and this is five or six years ago already. Click on that. And there is the gauge in two different versions that can be printed out. I have stock and material just about every place you can think of. But see that piece there that is wrapped in paper? It's been there for at least 25 years. I kind of forgot about it. I didn't even know it was in there. But it was uh, as I'm plowing around here for the proper material, I pulled that out. And there were two pieces of stainless steel in there. And they happened to be the exact same thickness as the original South Bend. How fortuitous was that? So the original item is 49 or 50 thousandths thick. And here's that stainless I was talking about. And... That's also 49,000. Uh, you know, it's almost unbelievable. But it doesn't have to be stainless because I'm not sure how well this is going to machine or certainly do not know how well we're going to be able to stamp. And I'm not going to get carried away with engraving here. You know, I don't like the stamping. Sometimes when you stamp numbers on there, you actually ruin your project. Have you ever noticed that? So there's the little sketch that I made that is available on my heap with all of the pertinent dimensions. And you know what you can do? You can print that out if you have a notion to. If you don't want to do all of this layout that I'm going to show you here presently, cut this out, which I took, I, I made a copy. Matter of fact, I, <laughs> I printed it off of my heap. 
and uh, a bunch of them. And what you can do is just glue this onto your stock and, and cut around that uh, like you would in kindergarten and it will be accurate enough. So that's a possibility for you people. But of course I'm going to do the layout here now. I already got some bluing on there. I did both ends just in case I need a spare or in case I ruin it. Not that I ever have. But uh, let's get started on that real simple layout and it's just so handy to have protractors. And the other thing that was so coincidental, I thought, is that this is two inches high and about two inches wide. Well, so is this stock that's been sitting on the floor here in my shop since the dawn of time. So there's not even very much waste. I'm going to cut off a piece right on that line with a bandsaw because it's rather clumsy working on this great big piece. So I'll be right back. But another possibility for you is to go ahead and lay out this angle here, which is 15 degrees, and you can belt sand that very accurately on your abrasive machine, and then you got something to hang on to. It's a little bit harder to do that on uh, the delta sander without this uh, moving around or getting so hot you can't touch it. Be right back. Okay, I haven't tried this yet, but let's uh, do this on the Rockwell 6 inch abrasive sander. Now I haven't even put a layout mark on here, but you certainly could. I'm going to use the miter gauge, which is set at 15 degrees. I did not pre-cut it, so I am removing a relatively large amount. So you could do it either way. Okay, there it is. Needs a good cooling off and deburring, and then one would cut it off to length and finish the layout. Just a suggestion. I almost forgot to mention that here's one that I made years ago out of aluminum sheet, and I think I used that in a video a long time ago. And I just put the uh, degrees on there in magic marker. So let's talk about protractors. Just about everybody has one of these and they are perfectly usable and it's already set to 15 degrees and it would just be set on there right like that, right to the corner and scribe it. However, I prefer the sterret type of protractors and you know there's two different kinds here. This one, well let me hold them together. The blade goes through the head, whereas on this one it's off to the side. This is really neat if you want to flip-flop something, if it's using uh, about the same angle. But either one, of course, is quite usable. Okay, this protractor is set for 15 degrees. It's a steroid. You know, I should get paid by steroid, but I've never received anything from them. But I've got to be one of their world spokesmen, don't you think? It's just I, don't, I do not reach that many people. But laying it on there like this, and I'm trying to hold it for the camera. And somebody said, you're waving things around. You know, no matter what I do, I get abused. So there's the 15 degree line. And then I've already taken my sterret combination square because this is two inches wide. So and I've laid out that tiny little line right on the corner. I probably should have started with a piece slightly bigger, but with this sterret protractor set at 10 degrees. And again, trying to line it up here best I can with these 78-year-old eyeballs. And there we go. All right, let me talk about this top notch, which is 60 degrees. And we want the center here, right where the pointer is, pretty much exactly between. In other words, we want to center it. And if you look at the drawing, you're going to see that that should be 9 sixteenths or thereabouts, depending on how accurately you did your previous layout. So let me go ahead and lay that out just with a ruler, and I'll be right back. I'll find the center of this as well, and that will be exactly one inch from the corner. 
Okay, I've established the center line here and here, and those notches are 7 16 deep. So I have set the square to 7 16. Now this could be done with a height gauge or a surface gauge, you know, just countless ways of doing it. Now, because of the drawing getting kind of cluttered as I made it, I made notations over here, and you'll see that the top V-notch is 60 degrees included angle, and the bottom is 70, although in some places it says 71. You know, it varies just a little bit, but what I'm showing you here will work just fine. Now, of course, this is a 60 degree fishtail, and it could be used here, but it would be kind of hard to establish it as perfectly square. Okay, I had a couple little disasters there. First of all, I just laid out the 60 degree and it turned out fine, but I was off the frame. You couldn't see what I was doing. So then I'm getting ready to work. I'll do it down here and it's the same principle. I had to relay this out. I smudged it so that you can see it. But here is why you will see that this type of square with the blade coming out the center is very handy. And in order to make a 70 degree included angle, I had to set this at 55 degrees. I don't want to explain that. But the idea here is that trying to get this in frame for you. And I got a shadow there that is a killer. And then I just flipped the square around to do the other side and there's no resetting it. Maybe I can do it on this side and it'll show up better. I am looking through two pairs of glasses and then I'm looking at the monitor. So it's harder for me All right. And we've got a glare there, but anyway, that almost completes the layout. Let me say one more thing now. If you examine many gauges, you're going to see that they use a hole at the, uh, well, should I say the apex there or the intersection of the line? Here's another example. And the whole size doesn't matter, but I'm going to use eighth inch. And you can even see it here. They use quite a bodacious. Uh, hole. So I will lay that out off camera and it's going to be approximately on this center line here a sixteenth of an inch or less below this. Now that helps a great deal when uh, we start to file this out or when these are manufactured. But of course this is manufactured on a punch press with an expensive die with two stamps. Bam! Out comes the blank and then it probably went into another press where they did the engraving or embossing. And then could sell it for 60 cents. Okay, there's the eighth inch holes drilled. You don't need to see that. We're just about ready to saw, but before we do, I want to talk about taper gauges and I, some, I have begged people to get a set of these. They do not cost very much. And there just so happens to be two gauges in here that are just what we need. There is a 15 degree, where does it say that? 15, and this is a 10, just trust me on that. And let me show you a couple different ways of using these, but I'm also going to use one of these on the milling machine when I mill at least uh, one side of this. And because of that, I really didn't need to do a lot of the layout. I could have done it all on the milling machine or on the sander, at least for all of the angles here on the edge, not so much the, the notches, but let's take a look at that real quickly. Bear with me. Let me point something out. This is the 15 degree one, and really it's ground, hopefully, from China very accurately right here. So that's, that's the 15 degrees. Not really here, or I'm not really sure of that, but since I'm going to check this for squareness, 
and I already did, and it is perfectly square. I think it is okay to use it the way I'm going to show you right now, but I'm sure some of you are going to uh, get mad at me, but we, <laughs> we could do our layout, boy that's dark right there, with a little angle plate and just bring that up again. So let me get some more light in there so you can see what I'm talking about. Have you noticed that some machine shop creators film in the dark? So I try to get light where we need light, but I don't know. Maybe I don't do that good of a job. But this is a three foot long piece, quite unwieldy. That's why I put the clamp right here. But using the 15 degree here again, if we would lay that right on there and bring it up accurately. And of course I'd have to stick my head in here to see that. See, and that's why I'm not doing that. And then it could be scribed very accurately, couldn't it? And then if we've already laid off, laid off the two inch mark, you know, right about here, then the 10 degree could be used on this side. And that works slick as a whistle, really. But you probably don't have a set of these. I just like to show you the usefulness of some of these things. There's nothing much more boring than to watch somebody cut something out on the bandsaw, so I will not torture you, you with that. So, but I'm going to rough cut this scrap off of here and also in the notches. Now, you know what I've noticed also? I hope I'm not being too critical, but I'm just talking about other uh, people that make videos that very seldom you see people use band, a vertical bandsaw. They use... Uh, grinders a lot. Now I just hate grinding, but they're using offhand grinder and it does a great job. It's just not something that I like to do. All right, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Actually, I'll be back in two seconds with this rough cut and then we'll talk about uh, accurately machining to the line. Don't worry, I'm not going to show the actual sawing, but I wanted to make a point here that this is a relatively coarse blade, and this is very thin material, so there's a big chance of ruining your bandsaw blade if you feed too fast, and this makes a heck of a noise, because I really need like a 32 tooth, and this is like a 16. It will do the job, because I've done a sample already, but I feed very slowly, hoping not to ruin that blade. That's the way it looks rough cut. Now, if you want to, you can use your sander and just sand to the line. But I already talked about that and showed you that. Let's do it on the milling machine. You could use a file. I'm at the Bridgeport Mill and I've showed you this method many, many times on other projects of how to uh, set your work parallel to the vise jaws. Now, before you do this, make sure you remove all your saw burrs from the back side, but the whole idea here, and we have a layout line there, and I'll do the 15 degree here, this method, I'll show you another method for the other side, but putting this quite close to the top of the, of the vice jaws, now I will lay a straight edge, and uh, re remember, we want this as close to the vice jaws as possible, so the work doesn't bend, this is just sheet metal. So whatever thickness of ruler you might have, I like this thickness, we can lay that on the jaws and then carefully with a uh, light and magnifying glass tap that one way or another until you get that line perfectly in line parallel with your straight edge. And that you can do that very, very accurately, but not as accurately probably as the next method I'll, I will show you, because this depends on your eyesight and your experience and a million other things. But I will, I got to get my head way in here and a little flashlight in order to do that. And that is not filmable, if there is such a word. and tighten. I already took one trial pass and I'm ready to cut right down to the line. Now you should always feed in the direction that you watch. You see me feeding here because that'll lay the burr off to the back side not off to the front like this. And then you can see your layout line. Otherwise you sometimes cover up your layout line.
Okay, the 15 degree side turned out perfectly. I'm ready for the 10 degree side. Now, nobody's going to do this, but I think it's kind of a neat way of doing it. So, I'm using a parallel because this gauge is thicker than the work. Moving that a little bit off to the side, and I will lay the parallel in like that. Again, 10 degrees. Bring this up close, and then I'm going to put the work in there up against the parallel. Now, I know my hands are going to be in the way, but essentially like that, and then I'm going to tighten the vise up. That makes sense? Again here, I'm just a little bit above the vise jaw, so I do not machine the vise jaws. And now I will remove the angle block. And if I would examine it or, or lay a parallel here, I, I could proof myself, but there's really no need. Let's mill. Well, now comes the hard part. How are we going to file or machine these notches? Well, this is 60 degrees. That's easy. You're going to use a three-corner file. However, this is 70. But here's what you're going to do. Not me. Put it in your vise and take your selection of three-corner files. They may come in small, medium, and large. This one would be good for the 70 degree, although it would do one side at a time, but this three-corner file would do both sides at the same time and would be very accurate if you can keep it level and straight and all of that good stuff. And you know what? You can't. And you can finish it up with a smaller one as needed, but also, like for that larger one, that 70 degree, let's use, uh, rough it out with with this, or even a flat file, but finish it off with a knife file. That will allow you to get into that corner and it has a safe edge. So here's a file that probably some of you have never seen, and you won't find one at Lowe's. But wait! There's more! There's lots more! Look how I'm going to do it. When I started this video, I had grandiose plans of showing you other ways of doing the layout with uh, height gauges, but, but I will spare you that. Many of you have been waiting six or seven years with bad breath, I mean bated breath, to see me use my <laughs> uh, power file here. And remember I rebuilt this in a video? And raise your hand if you have one of these at home. You know what, out of the 4,000 people watching, I didn't see a single hand go up, but this is the way I'm going to do it, and I have a triangular file mounted already, and I have squared up the table in both planes. Not that it's that critical, but you know, I can't see what I'm doing. You know, I'm wearing prescription glasses and these, and I got good lighting, but so I'm going to pull my magnifier over. By the way, some of these are sold with lights and magnifiers, some of the duals and the, the upper upper brands and remember that these are special files that cut only on the downward stroke. Now there's no belt guard out here so don't chastise me. I know we got the safety Nazis out there but I forgot to mention make sure you wear your safety glasses at all times when you're in your workshop if you value your eyes at all. This machine can be a finger pincher because at some point your work might start chattering up and down. If you got your finger under there, you got an instant blood blister. And so on until we get down to our layout line. Now I got to set up my magnifier and get serious. I hope
hope you enjoyed this short demonstration on a die filer. The correct name is die filer. And I know many of you have never seen one of these. They are scarce as hen's teeth. I did have a Keller at school. And uh, you had to buy the, <laughs> the files by the gross because they are relatively delicate, especially when a 15-year-old is using them. So it was not useful at all in a school shop. But, all right, I'm done, except for stamping. And I'm going to remove the bluing now, and I'm not going to get carried away, as I said, with the stamping. I'm just going to mark it 15 degrees on one side and 10 on the other. As you well know, it's almost impossible to stamp in a straight line, and sometimes you can ruin a project that looked pretty neat to start with, with your uh, craziness and your crooked uh, numbers and, and letters. So, you know, they do it real neatly on gun barrels and, and things like that because that's all rolled on. It's not stamped with a hammer. There's a roll die that is pressed uh, across it, you know, and, and rolled like a donut rolling. And it uh, produces a very uniform and uh, quality stamping because, and that's what is that wonderful, that wonderful logo of Winchester that we all love, don't we? All right, let me get the bluing off of this and I'll be right back. Not great, but the best this old shop teacher can do. 15 degrees on one side and 10 on the other. And I use 332nd numbers and 116th letters with the zero being the degree mark. Well, that completes the project. That completes the video. I hope you enjoyed it. It doesn't look as good as this because, of course, they got all of the beautiful logo and everything on there and if you want to stamp steel and you know 60 degrees iron 70 you can there's probably no need you may never use those I am not going to polish this because the stainless steel looks fairly good the way it is now if you want to make this remember all you got to do is click on uh, this Q code and it will instantly bring up that drawing for you well, even if you do not make this project, it was a fun thing to do. And I think by watching this video, you possibly picked up a lot of tips and uh, ideas that you can use in other projects. This is Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, saying so long for now. And be sure and watch at least one of my 1,400 other videos. So long for now. Well, I just finished the drawing for the little South Bend gauge, so I will put that at the end of the video so you can look at it. It's just a real simple sketch, and yes, this is the way old shop teachers still make their drawings. I know nothing about CAD.